Well, let me, today I'm going to talk to you about something that I believe that if you would, if you would listen, if you would apply it, it will revolutionize your life. It would literally, this message has the potential, and the reason I say potential, because every message has potential, and every word has potential. We know that the word that comes from God is alive, it's living, it's breathing, it has the capacity and the ability to change our lives if we would let it. Somebody say, if I would let it. Now say it again, say, if I would let it. The word of God is pregnant with possibility. And it's, it has the potential to give birth to the life that God has spoken. We know that the Bible says the words are life. They are spirit and they are alive. And that words can come into our hearts and minds. And so today, we're going to talk very practically. We're going to talk about something that we all know, something that we are very aware of, something that we kind of discuss, you know, very often. And uh, in the last few weeks, we talked about where do I start? I, I, I want to start the right way, and I, I want to go in the right direction. And we talked about the fact that we have to reflect. We have to look at where we're at. We have to know where we are so we can understand where we need to be going. We, we uh, discover our, our place, and when we discover where we are, that means, you know, it's kind of like real estate. It all has to do with location. You have to locate yourself. And once you've located where you are, then you can have the capacity to move forward into what you need to do. And today, I simply want to talk to you about you have to think. Somebody say, I have to think. Come on, say it again. Now, I want you to consider something, and uh, we have to examine ourselves by knowing where we are, where we want to go, and what is needed to get there. But consider how hard it is to change anything about yourself whether it is a bad habit that you want to stop or whether it's a good habit that you want to start or whether it's just simply a change in your diet, a, a change in your exercise routine, a change in your finances, or the most important, your spiritual progress. And uh, you promise yourself that this is going to be different. You promise yourself, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do, do things differently. I'm going to approach things in a different way. Yet you find yourself uh, making really no progress. And you find yourself further down the road in the same old boat. Change is hard. Let's say it together. One, two, three. Change is hard. Now that we've established that, Let's, let's not say it's impossible, let's just say it's hard. Uh, anything in my life that I've tried to change, any change that I've tried to make, there's always been incredible resistance. And I want to talk to you today about having some things that will help you to overcome some of the resistance in your life to become what God has intended for you to be. So uh, change is hard, but I think we make it even harder when we don't know what, where we are supposed to start and where we're supposed to end up. Now let's look at our key verse again in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Check this out with me. Watch what it says. Look closely at yourselves. Test yourselves to see if you are living in the faith. You know that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test. I want you to look again at those first few words. It says, look how? Closely. Somebody say closely. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look closely at ourselves. This is those watching online. This is not about investigating your neighbor. This is not about investigating. I know you might be sitting there watching in your pajamas, but it doesn't matter. We're going to look closely at you. I'm going to look closely at myself. You're going to look closely at yourself. The challenge of evaluation is to look at ourselves. And when we think of looking at ourselves, most of us first look at behavior. Because honestly, if we're honest today, that most of us, we want to change behavior. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We have to look at what we do. As a matter of fact, if we are happy with our behavior, we do not feel that any change is necessary. And we ultimately want to change behavior. We want to, we want to do and we want to respond differently and in a different way. But before any change can happen on any level of our lives, hear me now, I'm going to say this again. Before any change can happen on any level of our lives, the first place we need to consider is to think about what we are thinking about. Before any change happens in your life, you are going to have to think about what you are thinking about. One of the greatest obstacles to positive change within our lives is what I would term wrong mindsets. Wrong mindsets. Now, today we're going to talk about something that all of us are very familiar with, and that is thoughts. Uh, let me just ask you, how many of you have ever had a thought? 
How many of you are having a thought right now? How many men are just in your nothing box? You don't think about anything right now. We all have thoughts, right? And some of us think more than others. But, I, but the problem is when our thinking is defaultive and there's a default to our thinking, there can never be correct behavior in our lives. When there's an issue with the way that you think, no matter how hard you try, it's kind of like your life is set on autopilot and what sets your autopilot of your life is the thoughts that you're thinking every day. And if your life is set in autopilot in a certain direction, you are always going to find yourself eventually in that place. Now watch this, what Jesus says about this in Matthew 6, and 23. Now he's talking about, in the context here, he's talking about giving and he's talking about a generosity. But I want you to listen to what he says. I love this. Watch this. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, somebody say, when my eye is healthy, watch this. Your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. Wow. Now watch this. Listen to these words. And if the light, somebody say, if the light, listen to these words, you think you have, is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. So Jesus makes a statement here. He says that, that your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. It gives you the ability to know where you are going and where you are heading. And so when your eye is healthy, when you have a generous mindset and a generous eye, a generosity of life, he says your body, your, your, your whole life is filled with light. He says, but when your eye is unhealthy, your filtering system, your whole body is filled with darkness. And he says the problem is if the light you think you have is actually darkness, you are in trouble. That means sometimes we think that we are thinking the right way, but we are actually thinking the wrong way, and we find ourselves always ending up in the wrong place, all because of the way that we think. Now, let me give you some three thought principles. There are many more, but because of a, a, a lack of time, uh, this is not a 16-hour lecture. I know you want to see the charges win. So anyway, so let's, uh, uh, let's kind of work through this real quick. There, uh, let me just give you three thoughts uh, uh, about thinking, and that is all change starts with a thought. All change starts with a thought. Well, uh, l- let me really say this. Everything starts with a thought. Whether it's positive or negative, everything, it starts with a thought. You think it, and that's the root of it. Secondly, our thoughts determine our actions. Our thoughts determine our actions. John Locke said this, The actions of men are the best interpreters of their thoughts. If you want to know what people are thinking, then you look at their lifestyle, because that's eventually where you end up. And then number three, our constant thoughts become a predictor of our future. Our constant thoughts become a predictor of our future. Now, understand the difference between a fleeting thought, something that just passes through your mind. We all have fleeting thoughts. So we might have a thought that just kind of hits it. That's a fleeting thought. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the thoughts that we linger at, the thoughts that we think about, the thoughts that we ponder on, the thoughts that are keeping on musing. We kind of muse over it. We kind of run it through our minds again and again and again. It's kind of uh, like a, uh, a, you know, a CD or a DVD or an MP3. It just keeps on playing around in our mind again and again and again. And that constant thought is a predictor of where you'll be in your future. James Allen said this, you are today where your thoughts have brought you, you'll be tomorrow where your thoughts take you. So your thoughts are crucial. How many of you understand we got to think what we are thinking about? Now listen to this. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5 as we build this. Notice what uh, Paul writes and he says this, so be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Listen to these words, stay alert and be what? Somebody say it again. Clear headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be what? Clear headed. Twice within two verses, he tells you to be what? Clear headed. So, and then listen to these words protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Throughout Scripture, throughout the New Testament, you find that there's a reference to a helmet. There's a reference about our heads. There's a reference about our minds. There's a reference about how we protect our minds and what we do with our minds. Thoughts are what we call the inner conversation we have with ourselves. How many of you know that inner conversation you have with yourself is more important than the conversation you have with anybody else? What you talk to yourself about by yourself 
is a very, very great predictor of where you'll end up in the future. What you muse about, what you talk about. As a matter of fact, if you don't believe me, look what the psalmist, he makes it clear that before any change could happen in his life, he had to change his self-talk. Now watch this in Psalm 32 verse 5. He says, finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. And listen to these words. I said to whom? What, what is that? When you say to yourself, that's thinking, right? He said, I said to myself. So he's talking about his self-talk. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. So the psalmist is saying before any positive change took place in my life, he, he says, I'm going to confess to the Lord, but he hasn't confessed. And then he talks to himself and he says, hey, I've got to do this. I've got to. And the, when he has this conversation with himself, then guess what? That's when he ends up where what he talked about is about to happen. Now, in order for us to kind of build this over the next several weeks, I want to talk to you today about three things that we must do with our thinking in order to get them to a healthy place. Here's the first one. The first thing we have to do with our thoughts, we have to challenge our thinking. We have to challenge our thinking. And the question there, or what we are talking about there, is you ask this question, why am I thinking this way? Why am I thinking this way? Have you ever thought about your thoughts? Have you ever stopped and, and asked yourself this question? Why am I thinking this way? What, 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 why is this mindset in my life? Now, why is it so important to challenge our thinking or, or to put it in another way to think about what we are thinking about? Look at Proverbs 23. Notice what it says. Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacies. Look at verse 7. We all know this verse. For as he thinks where? In his heart, so what? So is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. Now this verse spells it out so clearly about the importance of thinking. And I, wanna, I don't know if this is in your notes. I don't think it is, but I want you to hear what I'm going to say. And uh, for those of you who've been around, you've heard me say this before, but this is profound if you can just get this. If you don't get anything else, I say get this. Listen to me now. The predominant thoughts in my mind will become the belief system in my heart, which will be the operating system of my life. Let me say it again. The predominant thoughts in my mind will become the belief system in my heart, which will be the operating system of my life. We have computers that have what? OSs, right? What are those called? Operating systems. And in order for, when what do they do? You've got to download stuff in order for that operating system to keep on functioning in a healthy way. And then very regularly, what do we get? We get a notice that we need an update. Is anyone know what I'm talking about? We need an update. Or your phone will say, update now available. You know, uh, um, Apple 17.011 or whatever they are at now. You know what I'm saying? And now, so now, and, and what happens is for the older phones, the older phones lose its capacity to update the older they become. I just recently, about six months ago, updated my phone. I, used, I, I had a 4S. My phone was so old that people looked at it and wanted to buy it as a classic. And, uh, um, you know, they could not believe that that phone can actually operate. But for years, for the last several years, my phone would tell me no longer able to update. So the problem with my phone is that there's a lot of people in first service who have no longer been able to update. We have had old systems of thoughts and predominant mindsets in our lives that we refuse to address because we are comfortable in our dysfunction and in our behavior and we don't allow the Holy Spirit to break into the mindsets that we have in order to do what needs to be done in our lives. So we trapped in a vicious cycle of repeated behavior and then we say we are sorry but yet we find ourselves back there again and again and again and again and again. Why? The predominant thoughts in our minds is now where it is now a belief system. We believe that's the way things are. And guess what? That's how we operate. That's how we naturally respond. We don't even have to think about it. We just naturally respond that way. Amen, Pastor Manny. That was really interesting. I like it. We have to challenge it. Now, I want you to look with me. I'm going to go real slow so that we can update here this morning. Watch this in Matthew 5 verse 8. Listen to what Jesus said, and, and this is powerful. I'm reading this out of the, the, the message translation. I love the way he puts it. You are blessed when you get your what? Inside world. Somebody say inside world. 
Listen to you. Your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You are blessed when you get your what? Inside world, which is your mind and your heart, how? Put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You see, where the mind goes, the man follows. It's as simply as that. Uh, I mean, just think about this. And, uh, you know, when, when you, let's use something that we all have tried. And uh, we've all have tried to change our eating habits sometime, right? Is there anybody in the room that can acknowledge that? I know you're all skinny and wonderful and in shape. So <clears throat> I'm not particularly looking at anybody. So I, I'm just saying, have you ever tried that? And then in your particular diet, it, it, it tells you that you can't have certain things. And whenever I'm on one like that, I'm all, the only thing I think about is this, not the stuff that I can eat. The only thing I think about is stuff that I can't eat. I, I mean, I'm not a big cheesecake eater, but when I'm on a diet, I think about cheesecake. I don't even like cheesecake that much, but because I can't have it, now it's something that I can't have. Now my mind is drawn to that. So suddenly I'm just thinking about, man, if I could just get to the cheesecake factory, thank God. They open up one in Temecula, and the line is four hours long just to wait to get in because nobody knows what that is. And so just so I can get a piece of cheesecake, because I love that cheesecake, and I don't even, but that's the, that's the thing. We, we focus on what we, uh, on what we should not focus on, and then what are, we, what are we doing? We are drawn towards it. It's, an, it's the natural thing. Wherever your mind is, that's where your thoughts will go, and as your thoughts will go, you will go. My thoughts will stir my desires and emotions, and then I'll make the decision to follow them. If we focus only on the negative things in our lives, here's what we become. We become negative people. Everything, including our conversation, becomes negative. I challenge you to think about uh, what you're thinking about. You might be discouraged and even depressed and wonder what caused it. Yet, if you examine your thought life, you'll find that you are feeding the negative emotions you are feeling. Negative emotions are fuel for discouragement, depression, and a whole lot of other unpleasant emotions. Why do you always do a certain thing? Why do you do what you always do? It is because you think the way you always think. A new life can only be shaped by a renewed mind, and a renewed mind can only come about by new thoughts. You've got to think differently. You've got to think in a new way. Someone once quoted this, as you wander on through life, brother, whatever be your goal, keep your eye upon the donut and not upon the hole. And too many people focus on what is not there and what is not right. That means that our thoughts largely determine our destiny. Our thoughts also determine our happiness. What that means then is that we cannot have a positive life with a negative mind. The greatest challenge for people to make a positive personal change uh, is, is not only in their minds, but it is really about their feelings. Because people say, well, I just don't feel like it. Have you ever said that? I just don't feel like it. So here's what we do. We allow our feelings to control our behavior. We want to change, but we don't know how to get past our emotions. But there is a way that we can do it. I can control my thoughts. My feelings come from my thoughts. Therefore, I can control my feelings by controlling my thoughts. Do you know the one thing you do have the power over is what you are thinking about? Turn to your neighbor and say, I think he's talking to me right now. Come on, turn and tell them. If you are willing to change your thinking, you can change your feelings. If you change your feelings, you can change your actions. And changing your actions based on good thinking can change your life. Now, this is not a mind over matter situation. This is saying that my mind and what it lingers on matters. So this is not cyro, you know, uh, you know, some cyber, cybernetic guru goofball kind of meditation. Just, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. This is not that. I'm talking about some mindless kind of repetition just to kind of be in a particular mindset or mind frame. 
I'm talking about the ability to know this is what I'm thinking about, the ability to examine your thoughts at a particular moment, moment to have the introspection and power to discern this is my thinking, this is my thoughts, this is the pattern in my life, this is why I keep on repeating the same old life, this is why after I have a cycle that every year or every two years I find myself in the same place. You know, if I, you know I go again, going down the same path, all because why? Because what I have never really thought about about is to challenge the way that I'm thinking about the life that God has given me. Let me give you another example. For example, just say you're unhappy in your job and you keep on thinking about how unhappy you are in your job. Then suddenly you make a decision to leave that job without thinking what the consequences would be for leaving that job. So because of what you thought about, it controlled how you felt about it, and then it caused you to make an impulsive decision, and now you've been looking for a job for six months and can't find a job, and now you have pressure financially all because you allowed negative thinking to persist in your mind instead of having a mindset and say, hey, listen, this might not be my dream job, but right now it's providing for me, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the way that I think. I'm going to start being grateful for the fact that I have a job, and I'm going to start being the best employee that I can be and be my best. I don't care what people say. I don't care what people do. I'm going to determine my destiny within myself, and I'm going to think about it in a positive way, and then I'm going to trust God for another outcome. Are you okay out there? Our problem is we are looking at change from the outside in instead of the inside out. What we try to do first is to change our behavior instead of changing our pattern of thinking. The question then is, if changing my life is simply to change my thinking or my thoughts, then here's the question, why is it so difficult to change my thinking? Come on, you've thought about that, haven't you? Now, here's why. To answer that question, I want you to go with me to the Word and go with me to Ephesians chapter 6, very familiar passage. Check this out. You know these verses off by heart. Watch what it says in verse 10. Are you out there, church? You don't have to say amen or anything. You don't have to clap or throw money. Just listen. Watch this. Ephesians 6 verse 10. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Verse 11. Put on all of God's armor so that you may be able to stand firm against all strategies. Somebody say strategies. Of the devil. The devil has got strategies. He's got plans. He's got thought patterns for you. For you to get caught in. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop, watch this, the fiery arrows of the devil. Now let's stop there for a moment. What are the fiery arrows of the devil? Because I mean, physically I'm not getting an an arrow that's fiery shot at me. So what is, what is Paul referring to? He's referring to the way that they would attack a city that had a wall. A city with a wall, the wall and the gates with a protection, and then they had people stationed within the wall. So if an enemy would come in to attack that city and they could not break through the wall, what they would do is they would light arrows, they will shoot it over the protection of the wall into the city to cause chaos in the city as far as the fire. Now the people that are supposed to fight the wall are now putting out fires inside of the city They then let their guard down, and as they let their guard down, now their ability to capture the city. So when it comes to fiery darts, what is it referring to you and I? He is saying, here's what the enemy does when he says, hey, you're strong, you're in church, you're good, everything is fine, everything is going well. Then what he does, he lights a fiery arrow, which is a thought with an intent to destroy So what happens, he shoots that over your boundaries into your mind. Because you've got to understand the mind is the battlefield. He shoots it within your mind, and then as it's fiery, it spreads, and now you think about it, and now the more you think about it, the more you're concentrating on all this now, whether it be a a perceived injustice, or whether somebody didn't greet you when you came into the parking lot, or, you know, the, the, the parking lot attendant showed you the middle finger by accident or something, and you don't even know he lost his all his fingers, and that's the only finger he's got, and you you didn't know that. You didn't know that he was in an accident. And now there's a fiery dart. 
Now, Pastor, he gets on the pulpit. He, he maybe says something that offends you. Guess what? The enemy takes that, and there's another fiery dart. And then things just keep on coming. And then, you know, if somebody from the office said that they were going to call you on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. They never called you on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Because what you don't know what has happened is that they happened to be the care pastor. And a Tuesday, all day long, they were with somebody that had a heart attack that they're sitting in ICU with that person. Now, you don't know because you don't have all the information. All you are receiving is a fiery dart. That now you are meditating on and now it's destroying and now you're trying to put out fires. And sooner or later, what's the enemy trying to do? He's trying to occupy mental real estate in your life. And the moment you allow him to have mental real estate in your life, he is now, why? Because he's planning on bringing you down. He wants to move you out of fellowship, out of community, out of connection, so that you can be in a place where he can attack you, where you are alone. And now suddenly you're thinking all these thoughts, you're thinking all these things. Oh, those church people, you know, they tell about loving God. They show me the middle finger. That preacher says he's holy. Did you hear what he said? And now you've got all these things happening in your mind, and it brings about destruction. Destruction. That's why you've got to challenge your thinking. Amen, Pastor Danny. There's another thing we have to do. Not only do we have to challenge our thinking, the second thing we have to do, we have to change our thinking. So the question there that I'm asking is, what am I allowing in my thought life? Now again, listen to these words. What am I allowing? What am I allowing? What am I allowing? It means you have to allow. You're the one allowing it in. No, I, nobody can tell you what to think. Now they can drop a thought, but it's for you to pick up that thought. It's for you to take that thought. Now watch this, Ephesians 4.22. You were told that your foolish desires will destroy you. Ephesians 4.22, notice. And that you must give up your old way of life with all its bad habits. Can I get an amen for that? I mean, can we get this clear? God is about changing our lives, not changing that on Sunday mornings we're now sitting in church instead of sitting in a bar. Oh, was that too close to home? Sorry about that. It's about not just changing our location of where we sit. It's about changing our hearts. About changing our habits, changing what we do. Okay, now how do we do? Look at verse 23. Let, somebody say let. let. What does the word let mean? It means to allow. Let the Spirit change your way of thinking and make you into a new person. Holy Toledo. Come on, Cleveland, listen to that. You were created to be like God, and so you must please Him and be truly holy. So we know the expectation of what we need to be. How we are going to be that is to allow the Holy Spirit to change our thinking. Why? To make us into a new person. I mean, this is not stuff that I'm making up. This is in the Word of God. So the thing is you've got to ask yourself, what am I allowing in my thought life? The mindset. Your mind is fixed on it. That's what a mindset is. Your mind is stuck in it. You know, it's like that old great spiritual song, I've got my mind set on you. Anybody ever heard that great song? Two of you, okay. I've got my mind set on you. The, the singer of that song is like, I've got my mind set on this girl. It, it's set. And that's one of the reasons why we don't listen to advice. Or we struggle to receive input from others. Why? Because we have a mindset already made up. Have you ever been in a room where you're trying to get a conversation and you're trying for people to give an input in a conversation and all they're doing, they're drawing from a mindset of, oh, there's no new thought. There's no openness to receive anything that's new. It's just a repeating everything that is old. Am I talking to anybody out there? Is this too close to home? Come on, somebody. It's one of the reasons why we struggle to receive. Our minds have already been set. So we have, listen to now, we have a predetermined response. And we simply just do the same we've always done or we do nothing like we've always done. So either it's immobilized us in our lives and we don't do anything about it or we just simply respond the same way we've always responded. Why? Because our minds is set on autopilot. It's just set that way. Now, there's two things that I need with this that in order for me to really change my thinking, I need two things. I need alignment 
And what I mean by alignment, uh, is this in your notes? Is there a place for that? Okay, write it in. Alignment with God's way of doing things. And that means I've got to align my mind with the Word of God. I've got to align it. So, so I've, got, I've got to make sure that when I put new, car, uh, new tires on my car, one of the things that they check is they check the alignment. They make sure that I'm not, you know, aligned. My, my tires are not going to run off either on the inside, be bumpy, or on the outside, or, 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 or on the inside of it. They make sure that the alignment is right. Why? Because it'll cost me wear, and it's going to cost me more money to replace. So they check the alignment. But here's the thing. As you go through life, not only do you need alignment, you need something else. You need realignment. And what do you need to realign yourself in your thoughts? You must realign yourself with God's purpose for your life. That's what you got to realign yourself. What does God says about me? What is God's purpose for my life? you got to align yourself with God's way of doing things, and you got to realign yourself with God's purpose for my life. Now, I, I want to say this to you in a loving way. This takes work. This takes effort. This takes constant input. You, you Don't think because you had a healthy thought life a month ago that is not a guarantee of a healthy thought life two months later. This is the constant place of battle. You say, Pastor Andy, it sounds like a lot of work. It is. How do you get free? W-O-R-K, work. You got to work it and you got to work it real good. Mm -mm -mm. You, it's, it's a constant. Why? Because thoughts are constantly coming. Even as I'm preaching the word right now, some of you are manifesting. Why? It's because you are literally thinking about, I don't want to think about it. That's your problem. I'm just trying to help you get set free. I'm trying to help you live the best life that God has for you on this side of eternity. But you're going to have to align yourself and you're going to have to realign yourself. Now, let me say it like this. Some gods need to be put up in your life and some gods need to be taken down in your life. There are some things that you are just going to have to guard against. Listen, you cannot think that you just sit in front of the television and receiving all kinds of information that it's not going to affect you. You cannot listen to any kind of rubbish and not think that sooner or later, oh, well, you know, I can just binge, binge watch. And that's fine, hey, but, you know, it's not going to affect me. I, really? Come on now. There are thoughts that are dropping in your heart and mind all along. There are arrows that are being shot at you all the time. There are images for men that are visual. We know that. There are images that are being flashed before you that now you try to get out of your mind and you've got to rebuke the devil. The devil you need to rebuke is yourself. Switch it off. Come on now, somebody. I mean, we've got to get a little bit more sense than this. And the, the, we've got to guard. So some things we have to guard against. We have to guard what comes in. But there's other things we have to let our guard down. The problem is we don't know how to discern. We don't know how to discern what should I allow in or what should I not allow in. The Bible says, set a guard over my mouth. The Bible says, guard my heart and mind. The problem with some people, they are open-minded. But the only problem is it's open at both ends. So whatever comes in doesn't stay. It just keeps going right on out. Now for some things that's good. For other things it is not. Some things must be allowed and some things must be resisted. Let this mind be in you. i got to allow it. Fill your minds. I've got to let it in. Meditate on these things. i got to ponder about it. Set your God. Oh, i got to watch out for that. God, be vigilant in your mind. And one of the things we have to guard against is this me syndrome. Love me, hear me, see me, bless me, encourage me. When do we get ourselves in trouble? Hear me now, church. You're going to be mad at me, but I'm going to tell you, when we try to fill a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. Do I have a legitimate need to be loved? Yes. Do I have an illegitimate need to be heard? Yes. Do I have a legitimate need to be seen? Yes. Do I have a legitimate need to be blessed? Yes. Do I have a legitimate need to be encouraged? Yes and yes and yes. But my need to be loved can be turned into selfishness when the only thoughts I think is how others love me or not love me. A mindset that says to myself, well, I deserve this. 
Shall I continue? My need for encouragement can turn into a desire to constantly seek affirmation and validation regardless of whether a job was done badly or well. Let me just throw this out at you. Anybody can praise or criticize. But it takes a person of wisdom to know when to use either one. Telling someone great job when it was really average at best sets them up for failure, not success. Because we lower the expectations to the point where average is what we aim for instead of excellence. Come on now. Oh, that was great. No, it wasn't. It was best at at best. Or it was average at the greatest level. Come on now, somebody. See, we can't handle that. Now, let me ask you a question when it comes to you and when it comes to your life. Would you rather have... A lie that makes you feel good or a truth that hurts but sets you free? Well, just tell me I'm okay. Just tell me, just make me happy. Just, just, oh, just give me constant positive affirmation. Just keep on doing that. And yes, but you're still trapped in your junk. And you got a whole junk in your trunk and that is funky. Come on now, somebody. Seek your truth is the only thing that can liberate us. So when I'm lying, even when it comes to my so-called encouragement, I'm not helping anybody. We have to challenge the way we think and change the way we think. Let me give you one more thought. And I'm going to do this in one minute. Probably not. How many think I can do it? How many think I won't? You're right. We said three things. What's the first thing we say you have to what? Challenge your thinking. And you have to ask the question, why am I thinking this way? Number two, we said you've got to change your thinking. And what question are you asking there? What am I allowing in my thought life? And the third one is this, you've got to consecrate your thinking. And here's the question, how much of God's word do I think about? Look at Philippians 2, 5. Let This mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Oh my goodness. Let this what? Mind be where? In you which was also in Christ Jesus. Godly thinking is what we would term, if you read the context in Philippians chapter 2, is what we would call selfless thinking, not selfish thinking. Godly thinking is possible because Paul says we must let it be in us. Peter affirms the necessity of having the same mindset as Jesus. Then why then is it so difficult to change our thoughts? The reason is our mind is the battleground, and the first place that the enemy attacks is in our minds. The devil understands even more than us that the battle is waged within our thoughts. The enemy of our faith is constantly shooting these fiery arrows beyond the borders of our minds. He is not just satisfied to shoot an arrow at us. He sets them on fire. Why? Because his plan is total annihilation. He understands and knows the fight we are in better than ourselves. That means whoever or whatever controls our thoughts will control our behavior. What holds my attention is what holds my thoughts. Playwright Hugo, uh, uh, Victor Hugo said this, an invasion of armies can be resisted, but not an invasion of ideas. Listen to this quote from the American Covenant. The battle for control and leadership of the world has always been waged most effectively at the idea level. An idea, whether it's right or wrong, that captures the minds of the nation's youth will soon work its way into every area of society, especially now in our multimedia age. Ideas are not harmless. Ideas determine consequences. The thoughts that you think in your mind has consequence whether you like it or not. If I can explain it to you this way. Think of your mind as the soil and the thoughts as the seeds that you are sowing in that soil. Good seeds produce a good crop. If you don't like the harvest that you are receiving, then you must stop sowing the seeds that you are sowing. Thought seems harmless, but if it becomes toxic, even just a thought can become physically, emotionally, or spiritually dangerous. 
And thoughts are measurable. They occupy mental real estate. Thoughts are active. They grow and they change. Thoughts influence every decision, every word, every action, every physical reaction we make are all birthed within a thought. Every time you have a thought, it is actively changing your brain and your body for better or for worse. That is science. It's a great book by Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Uh, it's a book called Who Switched Off My Brain. And listen to what she says. This is powerful. This is from a book. The result of toxic thinking translates into stress in your body. And this type of stress is far more than just a fleeting emotion. Stress is a global term for the extreme strain on your body systems as a result of toxic thinking. It harms the body and the mind in a multitude of ways from patchy memory to severe mental health, immune system problems, heart problems, and digestive problems. No system of the body is spared when stress is running rampant. A massive body of research collectively shows that up to 80% of physical, emotional, and mental health issues today could be a direct result of our thought lives. Now, how many of you know if that's a true statement and this is what they are finding out, then shouldn't you and I consider what we are thinking about? Let me say it like this. A toxic mind filled with toxic thoughts produces toxic emotions, and toxic emotions produce toxic words, and toxic words produce toxic choices, and toxic choices produces toxic habits. If your life is filled with a dump load of negative emotions and negative feelings that end up in negative relationships and negative responses, don't you think that God has a better way for you and I to live than always be filled with anxiousness and fear and worry and concern and always thinking negatively about other people, always feeling that somebody is out to get me, this paranoia that somebody is after me. You know, why did they say that? We always Isn't it amazing that we always want to dissect what other people are saying to us and we want to dissect it to the place of we even know their motive but we don't even dissect our own thoughts, our own thinking, and we don't even know our own motive. Man, I'm preaching good right now. So what do we do? Let me give you one thought. Write it down. You have to build a habit of healthy thinking. You have to build a habit of healthy thinking. Church, can you imagine what we can do if just us, just first service, starts thinking in a healthy way, having healthy thoughts? Can you imagine what it can do in your marriage? Come on now, can you imagine what it can do in your marriage or your future marriage, Jess? Because I know Martel has got very positive thoughts about you. He told me that. Some thoughts I didn't want to know, but anyway. It's too much information, man. Martel, you don't share. But you got to build a habit of healthy thinking. You see, you either have a healthy or an unhealthy thought life, period. Choice is yours. Say, the choice is mine. Now, it's not always easy to recognize what thoughts are healthy and which are unhealthy because they're so intertwined. But very simply, here's what we have to understand. God knows what we are thinking about, and that's why we have to consecrate our minds to Him. We have a choice to either think like a Pharisee or think like a Mary. Now, if you don't know what I'm saying, let me apply it real quick. Give me two minutes and I'll apply. Watch this in Matthew 9. Look at this. Jesus does an amazing miracle and listen to the response. Some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat. Matthew 9, 2. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Be encouraged, my child. Your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law said to themselves. Somebody say, said to themselves. So they didn't spoke this out loud, that was that inner conversation. So they didn't say anything that right now you're talking to yourself or I'm talking to you. How many of you know that? Now watch this. That's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Now listen to verse 4. This should shake you up. Jesus, help me out. Jesus knew what they were. He didn't say Jesus knew what they were saying. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them. Why do you have such evil what? Thoughts in your hearts. Is it easy to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? 
I mean, you, have got, you either have that, that pharisaical approach to life where you just kind of question, you just kind of, well, I know all this. Well, I, you know, well, I'm not a negative person. Are you kidding me? If you, are, if you are already resisting when somebody says you are thinking negatively, then guess what? It's highly likely that you are that. Because if, if a positive person does not have to defend their positivity. Because I'm positively positive. I'm positive about that. Come on now. Now, while I'm saying build a habit, hang with me. The nature of thoughts are that they are not stagnant. Can, can I get an amen for that? I mean, you know, thoughts grow, right? You could have a healthy thought life today, like we said earlier, but some uh, that does not guarantee that, that thoughts are staying healthy tomorrow. Because why? Because stuff keeps on being shot at me. Do, do you get that? God, you, you, can, you can have a great day, and then the next day, what's the enemy going to do? He watches you, he looks at your weakness, and he aims. Hmm, okay, I'm going. And guess what? He doesn't play fair. He doesn't play nice. Just because, you, well, I'm hurting. He, then he says, okay, now I'm going after you. That's why he's an enemy. That's why he's called the devil. He's a demonic being. That's out to destroy you. He is not, he's not somebody you're going to party with and drink some Bud Light in hell with. He's out, to get, he's out to kill you. He's out to kill your future. He's out to destroy your kids. He's out to destroy your relationships. He's out to mess you up. And it's time that you recognize it. And say, wait a minute. Why am I allowing these fiery darts to keep on, keep on messing me up? I'm going to make sure that my mind is consecrated. I'm going to allow the mind of Christ in my life so that whenever that enemy is shooting that arrow, the water of the Word is the only thing that can extinguish it. And Ephesians says the washing of the water of the Word. So the more I bathe my mind in consecrated thinking and I'm thinking the Word of God, then something pops up. I'm thinking the Word of God and it washes out the fiery dark. It's a constant work. It's a constant battle. But that's why the Bible says we fight not with physical weapons. We fight not against physical people. We fight against strategies, warped philosophies. We fight against ideas. Thank you for the amen. See, so you have to build a healthy habit. In, 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 in case you don't know the power of a habit... Listen to this. I'm your constant companion. I'm your greatest helper. I'm your heaviest burden. I'll push you onward or drag you down to failure. I'm completely at your command or command. Half of the things you do, you might just as well turn over to me and I'll be able to do them quickly and correctly. I'm easily managed. You must merely be firm with me. Show me exactly how you want something done. And after a few lessons, I'll do it automatically. I'm the servant of all great men and women and alas, of all failures as well. Those who are great, I've made great. Those who are failures, I've made failures. I'm not a machine, though I work with all the precision of a machine, plus the intelligence of a human. You may run me for profit or run me for ruin. It makes no difference to me. Take me, train me, be firm with me, and I'll place the world at your feet. Be easy with me, and I will destroy you. Who am I? I am a habit. And some of us have habits that we cannot break because we've allowed it to run our lives and it's running rampant and where you have to attack it is say, listen, I can't, go, I can't just stop this habit. What, do I, can, what can I do? I can control my thoughts. And I'm going to think in a new way and I'm going to think in a consecrated way and I'm going to consecrate my mind and I'm going to be like Mary. Look at Mary, Luke 2, 18. All who heard the shepherds, we just finished Christmas, listen, sto the story were astonished, but look at what Mary did. Verse 19, this is our approach. You can either be a Mary or you can be a Pharisee. Watch this, but Mary. Somebody say, but Mary. Watch this, kept all these things in her heart and thought about them. Mary said, hey, if this is what God is saying, then I'm going to keep that in my heart, and I'm going to think about them often. So what do you often think about? The fact that the world is not fair to you, the fact that you're getting a bad break, the fact that things are not help happening for you, the fact that people are not praising you the way you want to be praised, the fact that you're in a dead-end job, 
The fact that you're in a dead-end relationship, the fact that nothing is working for you, the fact that you're blaming everybody else, you're blaming your wife for not being a spiritual man, you're blaming your, your, your spouse for not being uh, the woman that you need to be or the man that you need to be. Can you just stop that nonsense and let me walk into your life for a minute and tell you that if you want a brand new life, you need to get some brand new thoughts. You need to renew your mind. And if you want to end up in a different place where you always find yourself and different habits that you always keep on repeating, then you need to start thinking in a renewed way. And you need to start saying, hey, i got to change the way I think. And you've got to work that mental real estate and you've got to plow that field of, field of your mind and you've got to allow some, some seeds of God's Word to penetrate and then you've got to water it. And how do you water, how do you water thinking? It's consistent. You consistently think about it in a positive way. When you have, listen, when I, when, if I take my spouse, for instance, and I always think about her in a negative way, guess what, guess what I'm going to feel? I'm going to feel about her in a negative way. I'm going to respond to her in a negative way. Every time she does something, I'm going to already read into her motive. Mm, there she goes, Miranda. You know, she sits there on the front row smiling, thinking that everything is okay, but I know you. The elders don't know you like I know you. The board don't know you like I know you, girlfriend. You out there just pretending, smiling, shaking hands. Hi, hi, hi. I'm Pastor Miranda. Hi, hi, hi. But I know who you are, woman. I know who I sleep with. I know the way you treat me, and that's just wrong. Because that's the way you think. And guess what? I'm going to be negative towards that. Every time, I mean, there's always going to be an issue in my life. There's always, instead of just saying, you know what? I love that girl. I love the way she smells. I love the way she smiles. I love the way she looks. Mm, 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 mm. I love the way she cooks. Mm, 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 mm. She doesn't, but I love it. everything about her. I can't wait to be with her. I can't wait for the second service to be over, to know that I'm going to get in the back office. I'm going to get a smooge, and she's going to tell me, mm, okay job, or great. She's going to tell me the truth. She has never lied to me. She'll tell me, you went too long. She will tell me, you should not use this illustration again. You shouldn't say these words again. Now, you be a godly man. She'll tell me, you come to, I don't feel like gonna, you go to church, and you be the man of God. She'll tell me the truth, but she'll love me through the process. And that, that's why I can continue to think about my relationship in a positive way. Is everything perfect? No. You've got two human beings that are together that, that have failure. She more than me because I'm a little bit <laughs> further along. But I'm gracious. Because I have a gracious mind. I understand that she's the weaker one and I've got to support her. This is one of those statements that I will regret later. Are you tracking with me, church? You want to change your life? Do you want to change your life? Do you want to change your destiny? Then change the way you think. And start there and say, i got to change the way I think, and i got to think God's thoughts. That will change your life and your heart. Let's bow our heads this morning. As a matter of fact, the word repent simply means a change of mind. That's what it means. We think of repent if somebody, you know, with a big old banner saying, repent, you're going to go to hell. But really, repent just means that I'm changing my mind. I'm changing the way that I thought about something, and now I'm going in a different direction. So some of you need to do that. Those watching online, you need to do that. You need to change your direction. If that's you today and you say, Henny, I want to change the direction of my life. I want to surrender all that I am to all that He is. I want to bring my heart before Him. If that's you, would you just pop your hand up and let me see it and I'll pray for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hands everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Those watching online, I'm glad you tuned in. Just there where you are seated. You're saying, hey, I, I need to change. I need to repent. I need to change. I need to go in God's direction. Then do that. I want to pray with you. And I'm going to ask everybody to just pray together in this. Let's pray out loud. Say this. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity that I have today to be alive. 
thank you for the opportunity that I have today to be in this place, to hear your word, to be able to respond and ask you to help me to change my thoughts, to change the direction of my life, to change the habits of my life. I ask you right now that you would come and give me the strength and the ability to change for your glory. I repent. I change my mind and I submit myself to your plan and your purpose. Align myself with your will. Realign myself with your purpose for my life. Right now, I surrender to you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you believe that, give the Lord a clap offering that He is worthy of today.